Hello, I'm Rit Udison, Executive and Artistic Director at the Loft Literary Center. Welcome to this live stream at Virtual Wordplay. I'm so glad you're here with us. Before we get started, I want to talk a little bit about what brought us here today. For the last year, the Loft staff has been working hard to put together an outdoor book festival that would have gathered 100 authors with 10,000 visitors in our neighborhood in downtown Minneapolis. As COVID-19 hit, we knew we had to think about everything we do differently, especially this festival. While we were disappointed that we wouldn't be able to gather in person, we became even more committed to supporting writers, celebrating new books, and finding new ways to assert the connective power of the written word. In a time of anxiety, we want to offer a powerful event for readers, writers, and booksellers. When we first approached our sponsors, their first question was, what is a virtual festival? And to be honest, we didn't know. Our founding partners, St. Catherine University and Star Tribune, agreed to make a leap of faith with The Loft. With courage, generosity, and vision, they have worked alongside us to figure out what this virtual festival might become. We are grateful to our sponsors and donors. Their generosity is incredible, but it is not enough. We believe it is essential, especially during a health and financial crisis, to offer programs that are free and accessible to all. But that has led to a significant revenue loss. A live event would have included ticket revenue, beer sales, exhibitor fees, and additional sponsorships. The loft is not closed. We continue to offer classes, fellowships, conversations, support for readers and writers in addition to this festival. We are here to support the literary community and we ask that you continue to support us. If you are able, please consider making a contribution to The Loft today. Thank you for being here. Hey everyone, welcome to our panel, Try a Little Tenderness, presented by the Montclair Literary Festival and the Lofts Wordplay. A special shout out and thank you to Wordplay's presenting sponsors, St. Catherine's University and Star Tribune. So to all our listeners, if you don't have a copy of Douglas Stewart's Shuggy Bane and Rowan Hazayo's You Can in Starling Days, you can correct that right now. There is a buy link below or you can get it from the Lofts uh, Wordplay Bookshop or if your own independent bookstore is open right now and taking orders as mine is, you can get it there. And there's also a button below to support uh, Loft programming. So I am honored to be here today with uh, Rowan and Douglas, whose novel I feel very lucky to have been able to read during this crazy time. Uh, welcome to the world of publishing during a pandemic. <laughs> I think it's really great that this has arisen as a way to keep readers and writers connected. So I'm, I don't know about you guys, but I'm really grateful for that. Even if getting onto Zoom is not always easy. <laughs> uh, so in the brief time before, in the before time, I should say, we didn't always start every conversation like this, but obviously this is how it is now. I want to know if you can tell us, share with us how you are and where you are, because you could be anywhere. Uh, I am in Montclair, New Jersey. so. Uh, Douglas, where are you and how are you? Uh, thank you, and thank you for having us today. Um, I am actually in the Hudson Valley, uh, so I'm lucky enough to be in the Catskill Mountains. I'm a New Yorker, and so I'm lucky that I was able to sort of come away from the city. And so right now I'm surrounded by a lot of green and a lot of promising signs of spring. Yeah, that's nice. Uh, and Rowan, where are you and how are you? Thank you for moderating this and thank you a lot for having us, of course. Um, so I'm in the UK, which is why these two are bathed in beautiful natural light and I'm in sort of <laughs> darker light. Um, and we're seeing signs of spring too. It's sort of like a more avant-garde apocalypse movie. The skies are blue, there's so much sun yeah. and yet something is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> These are not great times, but I'm, I'm very lucky and I'm very grateful for all the people who are risking their lives for us. So, you know. I think we're all in the same place there. I feel like the birds just sound a little bit more free, almost annoyingly free now when we go outside. <laughs> okay, um, so let's, I'm going to start with you, Rowan. If you, do you have a copy of your beautiful novel to hold up? Yes, I do. 
Yes. Okay. So there is the lovely, beautiful Starling Days. Uh, I Oh, all I was going to say is this is actually the British edition, which okay. is very blue. In the American edition, there's a large, elegant, slightly creepy starling that I really thought not because he's quite scary, but sadly I don't have the American copy. So you're just stuck seeing the British one. Yes, and I would have had the American copy had the world been different. Instead, I have the digital American copy, which is no fun to hold up at all. So um, okay, well, I saw, just saw that your book was, is in O Magazine and its list of books not to miss in April and May, which is, I'm sure, which is a really lovely thing. And I loved the book as much as they did. I think it's a jewel of a novel about two people who are deeply flawed, uh, as are we all, I would say, who are trying to love each other the best they can despite some challenges. Um, and I also want to say that I noticed that Forward Magazine described your novel as all about humanity and survival. So what else is there right now? Very, a novel we can all relate to in that way. Uh, so if I've left out anything important that you want people to know from the get-go, please add that. But if you wouldn't mind reading for a minute or two to give us a taste. Sure. Yeah, so I'm going to read from almost the very beginning so you don't need to know very much. It's from page two. So Basically, all you need to know is that we're in New York, it's nighttime, Mina is on George Washington Bridge, and she has been walking along looking at the water. The river was as dark as poor tarmac. They said that when a body fell onto water from this height, it was like hitting the sidewalk. Golden Gate had nets to stop jumpers. She imagined the feeling of a rope cutting into arms and legs. Your body would flop like a fish. How long did they have to lie there before someone scooped them out? There was nothing like that here. People said that drowning was a good death, that the tiny alveoli of the lungs filled like a thousand water balloons. She lifted one purple flip-flop and dropped it over the water. She didn't hear it hit. The shape, sorry, the shape simply vanished into the black shadow. That was when the lights got brighter and the voice, male and certain, lobbed into her ears. Ma'am, step away from the rail. The police car's lights flashed blue and white and red. Once she'd had an ice pop those colours and the sugary water had cooled behind her teeth. Ma'am, step away from the rail. Good evening, officer. Have I done something wrong? Mina asked. Please get into the car, he said. There were two of them. The other was younger and he was speaking into a radio. It was hard to make out his words over the wind and traffic. Was he talking about her? This is a public walkway, Mina said. It was open. I haven't done anything wrong. Ma'am, get into the car. I don't want to get into the car. Look, I was just getting some air. I was thinking I'll go home now. Mina had never been in a police car. She'd read once that the back doors only opened from the outside. Who knew what would happen if she got into the car? The window was rolled down and the cop stuck his head out. There was a lump on his upper lip, a pimple perhaps? Where are your shoes? It's hot out, she said. Where are your shoes? I don't want to tell you about my shoes, she said. I haven't done anything wrong. I'm an American citizen. Ma'am, where are your shoes? She lifted up the single flip-flop she had left. The other one broke, she said. Behind him, other cars continued into the night. Did they even notice her standing in the dark, a small woman with bare legs and feet? She was aware of the blooming bruise she caught banging her knee on the subway door. In the shower that morning, she'd skipped shaving her legs. In the beam of his headlamps, could he see hair standing up in splinters? Ma'am, I really need you to get into the car. I can't leave you here. What if something happened to you? In his voice, she heard the insinuation that normal women, innocent women, didn't walk alone on bridges at night. I'm fine, she said. Mina knew her stubby ponytail was frizzy. Bleaching black to Marilyn Monroe blonde had taken four rounds of peroxide. Now it stood up in breaking strands. If she'd conditioned it, would this cop think she was sane? If she'd blow-dried it, would he have let her go home? And of course, there were the tattoos twining up her arms. We can talk about it in the car, he said. 
A shadowed friend was bent over the radio, lips to the black box. Mina was tired. It was the heat or perhaps the wind. So she got into the car. So I'll leave that there. Thank you Thank so you. much. That's lovely. Thank you. Okay, Douglas, can you hold up that gorgeous Shuggy Bane cover? Ah, here we are. Ah, there's Shuggy. Is it Shuggy or Shuggy? I've Actually, that's a great question. It's okay. actually shuggy, uh, shuggy, like huggy, rather than shuggy, like sugar. Okay, thank you. Shuggy. Shuggy. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, so I love this book. About your novel, the New York Times said, the book leaves us gutted and marveling. Life may be short, but it takes forever. And once again, I feel like it could be speaking to this moment. Uh, we all, I think, are feeling gutted, but with moments of grace that kind of make us marvel. And if anyone here has experienced a day that felt like less than a month, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so this book is uh, the story of a family in Glasgow during the time of the, the Thatcher years. And uh, Shuggy is, is the youngest member of this family. And uh, it's mostly about Shuggy and his mother, but the whole family and about love and adversity and addiction and hope, the wholeness of life. Uh, would you mind adding anything I've missed and then reading for a moment or two so we can hear some of your novels? Yeah, I, I think you covered it beautifully, Nancy. Okay, um, it is actually, as you said, it's a love story uh, about the Bain family struggling under the Thatcher years in Glasgow. And actually, funnily enough, Rowan and I didn't discuss this beforehand, but it seems like we're both going to consider women looking at the world from a great height as the thing we're going to read to you today. Mm, so interesting. This actually comes from the beginning of the book also. This is where we meet our heroine, our protagonist, Agnes Bain, and she is living in the Sight Hill Towers, and she is looking out at the city and longing to be a part of it. Agnes Bain pushed her toes into the carpet and leaned out as far as she could into the night air. The damp wind kissed her flushed neck and pushed down inside her dress. It felt like a stranger's hand, a sign of living, a reminder of life. With a flick, she watched her cigarette doubt fall, the glowing embers dancing 16 floors down onto the dark forecourt below. She wanted to show the city this claret velvet dress. She wanted to feel a little envy from strangers to dance with men who held her proud and close. Mostly, she wanted to take a good drink, to live a little. With a stretch of her calves, she leaned her hip bone on the window frame and let go of the ballast of her toes. Her body tipped down towards the amber lights and her cheeks flushed with blood. She reached her arms out to the lights and for a brief moment she was flying. No one noticed the flying woman. She thought about tilting further then, dared herself to do it. How easy it would be to kid herself that she was flying until it became only falling and she broke herself on the concrete below. The high-rise flat she still shared with her mother and father pressed in against her. Everything in the room behind her felt so small, so low-ceilinged and stifling, payday to mass day. It was a life bought on tick with nothing that ever felt owned outright. To be 39 and have her husband and her three children, two of them nearly grown, all crammed together in her mammy's flat, gave her a feeling of failure. Him, her man, who when he shared her bed now seemed to lie on the very edge, made her feel angry with the littered promises of better things. Agnes wanted to put her foot through it all, or to scrape it back like it was spoiled wallpaper, to get her nail under it and rip it all away. With a bored slouch, Agnes fell back into the stuffy room and felt the safety of her mammy's carpet below her feet again. The other women hadn't looked up. Peevishly, she scraped the needle across the record player. She clawed at her hairline, and turned the volume up too loud. Come on, please, just the one we dance. No yet, spat Nan Flanagan. She was feverish and arranging silver and copper coins into neat piles. I'm just about to pimp out a lot of you. Reenie Sweeney rolled her eyes and held her cards close. You have one filthy mind. Well, don't say I didn't warn you. Nan bit the end off a slab of fried fish and sucked the grease from her lips. When I'm done taking all your menage money at these cards, you're gonna to have to go home and fuck that bag of soup bones you call a husband for more. No chance. Reenie made a lazy sign of the cross. I've been sitting on it since Lent and I've no intention of letting him get at it till next Christmas. She pushed a fat golden chip into her mouth. I once held off so long, I got a new color telly in the bedroom. <laughs> Thank you. That's lovely, great. Okay, so this panel is called Try a Little Tenderness. So we're gonna really start out by talking about tenderness. 
Uh, and what I wanted to say about that and ask you about is that writing uh, honestly and difficult about difficult honestly about difficult subjects as you both do with tenderness, I think is a real accomplishment. And what I'm curious about is when you were first when you in your first draft or early drafts of the book was the heart and the hopefulness that's in both of these books present from the beginning or or did you have to kind of go back and weave it in because it, it really wasn't so did you like ha, emotionally how did the book un, unravel in the writing uh so uh, rowan i can start with you okay so for this isn't much of a spoiler for anyone who's listening what happens just after the bit I read to you is that her husband, Oscar, comes to pick her up because the police won't let her leave by herself. And the book is then told from both of their points of view as they try to figure out what's gone wrong, essentially, and how to fix it. And I think for me, there always was hope in the book because when I think about people... I have known battling their own minds. It's a battle. It's, there is a side that says, I want to be alive. I want to stick with this. I want to hold on to the world. And I would have felt like I was doing the battle a disservice if I didn't show that side too, if I didn't show the yearning they both have to build this functional, beautiful life that's in some way why the struggle matters, why the down days matter, why the destruction matters, because there is something there that is beautiful that can be lost. And I think that's the only thing that makes it a battle. Thank you. And Douglas, I mean, obviously there's, there's so many similarities in, in, in these things, in your books, and that you both have characters who, who want to see the best in people, and but also see the worst or all the parts. So please, Douglas. Yeah, so Chuggy is the story about, as you said, about Agnes Bain, who is sort of finding that her life isn't turning out as she had hoped, and her husband has philandered and left her. She's succumbing to addiction as the city around her is sort of crumbling. And so for me, when I just started to write it, what I wanted to do is because I grew up in that sort of environment, I wanted to be as truthful and as honest as I could be and not to parcel the difficultness in a way that was more palatable to a readership. I just wanted to tell it as honestly as I could. And part of what I had ever learned and how I'd grown up was that during the most difficult times, sometimes the most um, incredible tenderness emerges. Uh, there's always sort of kindness, there's always humor, there's always love within these times. And really I'm always fascinated by the sort of the tension between those two things. And I think as my writing sort of progresses and I work on some other things, I'm always fascinated by, uh, I think I'm always drawn back to gentle souls who are trying to survive in really hard places, especially men actually, funnily enough, because I think it's, it's harder to be a very kind or a very gentle man um, when the world is sort of very violent or is sort of decaying around you. And so for me, they've always been bedfellows. And I think, when I was, because I write about some quite horrific things in the book, you know, I steal the innocence from a child. We really do watch the destruction and disintegration of his mother. Mm -hmm. And I think without sort of love and tenderness and hope and the truth of that, it would almost be unbearable in a way. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think they've, I never had to layer it in later. It always sat sort of cheek by jowl. And that was by having them be that way, that was the best way I could get to the truth. Um, and it made me feel like the people I grew up around as well, you know, and so um, that's what I wanted to convey. Well, you even have the humor is there in the little section that you read in the midst of all that. There's <laughs> just, uh, she got that, what was it, that TV set. She got a telly, she did. She, she got the telly, <laughs> so <laughs> no matter how good things, bad things get. Okay, um, all right, we're going to talk about origin stories because everybody always wants to know that. And so I want to ask you about best you can describe the origin stories of your novel, but I'm also very interested as someone whose novels end up far from where they began, <laughs> how close your novels ended up to your first, the, 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 you know, the beginnings of this novel or how, how much they diverged or, or didn't. So Douglas, should we start with you this time? Yeah, sure. Um, gosh, I have a really sort of uh, 
meandering origin story with the book. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm actually, primarily I was engaged actually in another field. I make my primary living through fashion design, funnily enough. I'd always wanted to be a writer in school uh, when I was a kid, but it was just seen as a boy growing up uh, on the south side of Glasgow is not something like boys that me did. Um, it just wasn't seen as a sort of career. So when I came to writing, I came to it sort of without the benefit of an MFA in that way and sort of just really began writing for myself. So it took me 10 years to actually write Shuggy Bane, but uh, that was because I, I didn't really have an end destination for it in mind and I didn't know where I was going with it. I wrote it purely because my soul needed me to do it. And actually when I sat down to begin writing it. I didn't even know I was writing a book. I wouldn't admit to myself I was writing something that was long format because it was far too intimidating. And so what I really did was the book came out in a very sort of non-sequential, non-chronological format. The, the finished book is chronological, but you know, chapter 13 came to me first, which is this very sort of almost filmic chapter of Shuggy and his older brother on this black sea of slag. And I could just picture the characters and how they felt and who they were. And it sort of came out in this way. But over the years, the book, because um, I think I've always suffered for a sort of, from a sort of working class stigma. And so I never imagined my book would be published. And so I didn't hurry to finish it. I didn't have an end goal in mind for it. And so the very first draft or the first couple of drafts were 900 pages, single spaced. So, I mean, that's almost like an 800, 1800 page book. <laughs> and so the funny thing is someone asked me the other day in the book itself, I mean, I think by the time I submitted it, it was draft 13 um, to my agent. The book never changed, um, but it distilled a lot. Um, I found because I was writing this story of these families struggling in Glasgow, not just the Bain family, but I wanted to set them in amongst the context of lots of families who were struggling. I found, which was my weakness, I think, that I was right, everything fascinated me. And so, oh, the lady up the street had this really interesting story in this part. And so by the time, you know, at working through subsequent drafts, I had to distill it down, but the book never really changed its intention because its intention was only for me, I guess is the best way That's to, interesting. to sum it up. Thank you. Rowan? Um, so this is my second novel. My first novel was a book called Harmless Like You. And but this is my second published novel. I wrote another book in between, actually. I wrote a whole book. I um, <laughs> sent it to my agent. We actually have the same agent, by the way. What a coincidence. Her, coincidentally, <laughs> agent siblings. Um, and I said to her, like, this book isn't working and I don't really understand why. I've edited as much as I can. Can you look at it? What do you think? And she looked at it and she went, Rowan, you've written two books and you put them in one book and that's not gonna work <laughs> and I thought I thought I was doing the Shakespearean thing of comedy and tragedy she's like no no sorry don't decide what you need to do so I was very alarmed <laughs> but I thought she was right I knew as soon as she said it that she was right and in fact that day I had to go to a talk a little like this at a festival um in person and tell people like how to write a novel. And I said, yes, I know the answer to this question. Meanwhile, my heart kind of, oh my God, do I know this question? I don't think I do. Um, and I went away and I sort of started to think what had gone wrong in that draft. And I realized it was because there was a whole strain of that book that was really fun to write. It was a satire, but I didn't care about it to my bones. And there was this other character who I did. And so her story started taking up far too much of the book. And I realized that although I wasn't gonna turn that into a novel, that I needed to look at why that was and what concerns and questions did I have that were exploding the book. Yeah. And I ended up realizing that what I urgently needed to understand and to write about was both why someone would want to die and how you could love a person while they were going through that. And it, this book isn't autobiographical or secretly biographical about a friend, but I have had multiple people in my life who I really loved and cared about go through mental health crises when I was much younger than the characters in the book. The characters in the book are in their 30s, they've just gotten married. But when I was 15, I had tried to kill myself and it's a very different situation. Um, but I had been on the receiving end of the help 
people trying helplessly to love me and not knowing what to do. And I wanted, and these were thoughts that were building and building and building. And what really, there are two things that really hit me. One, a friend of mine who, and this really is a friend, it's not me, um, who I can't talk about too much because it is someone else, but their mental health medication stopped working. And I never, I had no books to deal with that to help me understand because I was very, very close to that person. And for me, I guess I understand the world through fiction. I'd always see narratives either like medicine will solve everything or medicine is evil. And that wasn't the case with this person. When this person had been incredibly helpful, they'd built an entire life around having this medication work for them. And it had been a good life, a great life. And then it had stopped. And that threw everything into question. So you find out in the beginning of this book that Mina's medication has stopped working and she's been on it since she was very young, since the woman who raised her grandmother died. And so I sort of, I needed to create a book to understand that process and to understand how to think about it even. Meanwhile, there was something, you know, you see lots of stuff in mental health going around the internet and something that was said a lot is you need to learn to love yourself before anyone can love you. And I, every time I saw anything along those lines, I find myself becoming almost angry because I would think about everyone I loved and the love I had been lucky enough to receive. And I think that's not true, but I would also know how, what they meant, how if you are really, really deep in a mental health crisis, there is a desire to push everyone away. And so this couple came to me and I thought, okay, but what happens if you try to hold on to that person? What, what does that story look like? So I guess that's what Starling Days came out of. That's great. You can see, I think, uh, again, what your stories share is that there's, um, there's a lot of overwriting. You know, there's a lot of writing more until you really find, come back to figuring out what it is that's at the core. Um, I'm going to ask one more question because I know that there are audience members who want to ask questions. But this is uh, really think, and I have a lot of I have a lot more questions. So if they don't, ask, if there are not a lot of questions out there. I'll, we'll circle back. But since both of you are writing uh, about things that um, were very personal, whether they were things you observed in someone close to your lives or things that happened to you. My question is about the difference between writing about that when you have forgotten when you're in the book, so let me approach it this way. When I'm writing a novel, I'm in the novel and I'm not thinking about when the novel comes out and the people who I know who are in my family who know everything about me are gonna be reading that novel. Uh, and kind of the deeper you go to the bone of, of truth and things, it, it's harder to uh, imagine what those people are gonna think. So are you aware when you're writing, when you were writing these novels, how the people who grew up with you or who went through some of these really difficult times are going to think when they read this novel? Cause they'll know which parts are real and which parts are invented. They'll see those scenes, other readers won't. Uh, or did you kind of not think about that till you were finished and then had the thought of, oh, <laughs> what's my family gonna think? Or what are these friends gonna think? Um, so Douglas, I'm going to start with you and ask if that's occurred, to, uh, when that occurs to you, or if it never does. Yeah, that's a, actually, that's a great question. I've not been asked that question before. Mm -hmm. um, so Chuggy, again, as I, I said, really sort of deals with um, a family who are dealing with their mother's addiction. And I am the queer son of, and I lost my own mother to addiction. And so a lot of what I write about addiction, I write from the inside. And not only certainly within my own family, although the book is a work of fiction, but uh, the time within Glasgow was an incredibly difficult time. Um, unemployment across the UK was about 13%, but within Glasgow it was about 26%, and it stayed there for about a decade. And so just men and sons were put out of work, and families were sort of struggling and disintegrating. And then there's such an insular component to the sort of the housing schemes that the characters are set on, and also the housing scheme that I grew up upon, that I, that I wanted to bring to the page. As I said at the beginning, I sort of approached, I had bravery through ignorance because mm -hmm. I didn't think um, the book was going to be published. I thought mm -hmm. I was writing something uh, that was just cathartic, almost quite soothing for myself. Mm -hmm. um, a big part of the motivation of why I wrote the book, I think, is because being an immigrant now and living in America, 
I was feeling very sort of distant to who I was as a kid. I feel almost like two different people that are very divergent. Mm -hmm. And so part of writing the book was really to reconnect with where I grew up, who I was, the people I love, uh, and the people that formed and shaped me. Um, it's incredibly Scottish to be very direct and very honest mm -hmm. about difficult things. And that is the way we should be about it. But it's also very Scottish never to discuss personal things. And so those two things sort of sit in attention with each other. Yeah. Um, I remember after my own sort of uh, mother died, I turned to a family aunt and I was only uh, 16. And I was talking to an aunt and my aunt listened to me for about five minutes and her advice for me was, is, well, everyone has problems. And so the amount of grief counseling I got for that was sort of like- <laughs> Get on with up, it. Get on with it. And that's really the stuff that everyone has problems. And uh -huh. um, in a way that was terrible for me. In another way that was hugely helpful because it was the most cauterizing advice I've ever had in my life that sort of um, did all that. And so I didn't have nerves about the book being read by people until publication started to come around when uh -huh. I had to almost face up to my demons. Um, <laughs> And it's, I have a bit of a reverse story where, because I'm a Scottish American novelist, it was published in America first. And wow. so it's not coming out in the UK until August. Wow. And so I'm not sleeping a lot because I've still got to confront <laughs> all of that. <laughs> oh, I'll have to all come back and hear how it went. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Rowan, how about you? So the novel is, I was trying this, is a lot about the conversations the characters are having with each other about what it means to be ill and having with other stories in the world around them. So Mina's a classicist and she's trying to write a paper about what it means to be a woman who survives. Meanwhile, her husband is Googling her symptoms on WebMD and she's trying to figure out what it means. And so because she's a contemporary character who is has access to the internet, she has access to everything that you or I would have access to when we're looking at it. So I was thinking in a weird way about a conversation with the wider conversation about mental health. So, and there are times when I was trying to see it through the two characters' eyes because they see it very differently. So there's a point when she's thinking about the fact that the statistics for suicide for men fewer men try to kill themselves than women, but more men are successful. And that that's often seen that women are more often trying to have a cry for help. And the character, Mina, says, or maybe women are more afraid of hurting their faces because they've been taught, yes. if, you or, if being alive is already hard, being a woman who is not attractive is harder. And most of the more higher percentage of completion ways of doing it would risk severe scarring mm -hmm. and so I was thinking about that way of conversation that really mattered to me a that I'm just showing these two characters like who are very different ways of their attachment Oscars like maybe a list will help you solve your problems and she goes and she tries it and to see that these are individual people trying different things with a particular view that talks to this big conversation but that I wasn't trying to say and this is the forever view of mental health so I was thinking about that and that's actually why there's an author's note in the back to readers who might be going through something mm -hmm. but in terms of my personal life I think I wasn't as aware that people would react to it mm -hmm. because fiction I'm, I'm not there was some stuff that Nobody was going to feel like I was putting them under a spotlight as a particular person. What I actually didn't anticipate is the amount of tenderness I've received from the people in my life who were almost worried for me to be writing about Aww. these things, um, which I'm very grateful for. But I think largely my anxiety is the traditional author ego anxiety that I would have if I was writing a book about cats. It's just, I did as good a job. Maybe the anxiety exists no matter what we write about. Okay, I'm going to ask one quick, just fun question, and then we'll open up to the audience. Okay. Uh, a perfect writing day uh, prior to December 2019. And now that we're in this strange time, is it going to be that? Is that the 
perfect wedding day that you aspire to in the year X, we're going to get there? Or do you have a different uh, idea of what your perfect wedding day would be? Douglas. Oh, wow. Sorry. Actually, Rowan. They, they, I have a very <laughs> low bar for a perfect wedding day. And the, only thing I have hope, <laughs> the only thing I hope for is because I live in New York, I have a one bedroom apartment. I just yeah. hope my husband goes to work early. Uh -huh. And so if he just like get gets that. out of there, then, yes. um, then I can be by myself a little yes. bit longer. And so, Solitude. Um, but that's about it. I think um, what's been really interesting about what's happening, there's many interesting things, but what sort of struck me is uh, the need to slow down an awful lot with what we are writing and what we're producing. And I've been really struck by the idea of, and I think everybody is, is sort of like, what does it mean? And what, why does the world need it at the moment? I think we're sort of seeing, um, we're just seeing sort of like a re-evaluation of what it is we need to survive and what's important to people. And so as a writer, for me, I'm trying to actually just um, step back a little bit. So in the past, my perfect writing day would be one where I showed up at the desk and I got on with it. And actually I'm trying to just disengage a little bit. Mm -hmm. I think we can all understand that. How about you, Rowan? I think my perfect writing day has not shifted that much in terms of how I imagine it, whether I can get there or not, mm -hmm. the chain of change in the current circumstances. But I, I set myself, when I'm doing a first draft, a really tiny minimum word count. It's, I ask myself to write 250 words mm -hmm. because if they're terrible and dead in the water, it doesn't hurt that much to delete them. Right. If I am incredibly involved and excited, I say, fine, keep going. That, that's okay. And that has largely worked for me because I don't really want to produce a lot of language every day. I just want to feel like I'm writing about something that matters and feels true and is a useful way of understanding the world we live in. And there are a lot of days where I write things and delete them, but just trying to up the percentage of that because, yeah, I, like I think probably all of us have days where I go, why, why be a writer? But... Mm -hmm the thing I can't help but believe in. I think because I've needed books, so I have to hope that the books I'm writing will be useful to someone. Well, yes, neither of you should stop writing, that's for <laughs> sure. <laughs> but I think we can all use to step back and absorb what we're going through and not pretend that it's any old day. Um, okay, thank you both. So I think we're going to have questions from the... Hello. Hi. <laughs> Yeah, we do have some audience questions. Terrific. Um, let me pull them up here. Uh, yeah, we have a few. Um, so our first one from Abby, uh, for both of you, how are you both holding tenderness in this challenging time? Well, would you like to answer that? <laughs> <laughs> I will moderate the question and answer. Okay. Don't have to worry about um, who should call in. Um, I think there's sort of, you know, there's, be, there's the tenderness you have to hold towards yourself, which for me is largely taking a lot of baths. Some days I've taken <laughs> three baths. I'm very clean. <laughs> <laughs> it makes me feel good. That's um, yeah, right. um, and I think I'm trying to hold tenderness as for other people, just in terms of thinking of my friends who live alone because I'm with family and I know not everyone is. And although I too struggle sometimes to want to be on the computer or see the news or who do I know who I should be trying to contact, stay in touch with. And that is what I, I mean, it's a small goal, but it's what I'm trying to do. Yeah. Douglas? Yeah, actually, I agree with the, it's been the same for me uh, as to what Rowan just said there. Uh, I've actually been coming away from technology as opposed to moving more towards it because I've actually found it more overwhelming because I was isolated yeah. already and it's, I felt it encroaching on me too much. And so to hold tenderness, I've been trying to just be very present and in the moment. Um, I'm in an apartment with my husband. And so just trying to sort of, um, 
just sort of be present and lots of small gestures. We're cooking a lot, we're baking a lot uh, and just being together as much as possible. We've been together 23 years and I'm like still learning things about them through these past couple of weeks that I didn't even know. <laughs> and I'm not sure I wanted to know. Um, but So that's it. Right, because this is the person that you're like, get out of the house and go to yeah. your job so I can write. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, it's so funny just how you sort of like notice someone differently when they're almost their, their momentum comes away and they sort of slow down and they still and their purpose, their job is sort of comes away. And so it's fascinating. So it's been really nice to get to know them on a different level again. That's awesome. mm. so nice. Yeah. Baking, bath taking. I love it. Very tender. <laughs> Um, we have another question from Caitlin, who wants to know, who are some of the authors and artists whom you enjoy who also write about or with tenderness? Or what books feel like home to you? Douglas, would you like to take that first? Sure. Um, I, I am such a fan of both Agnes Owens and Janice Galloway who are two female authors writing on the west coast of Scotland. Uh, but because they are um, female authors writing about sort of a very hard environment, a very industrial uh, working man's landscape, the amount of tenderness and the amount of, um, you know, Alistair Gray once said that sometimes when men write about those environments, they tend to descend into violence and alcoholism and mm. uh, sort of misogyny very quickly. And so to see both Janice and Agnes sort of write about sort of unemployment and addiction and these other things, but to write about it with a female perspective is always somewhere I turn to when I want to expand my own mind and improve my own writing and just feel the comfort um, of, of other writers. So I'm a huge fan of both Agnes Owens and Janice Galloway. Rowan? Okay, so because I currently have it on the floor next to my desk. <laughs> That's convenient. It, it deserves to be somewhere on a more beautiful shelf. There is Alexander Chi's essays, uh, How to yes. Write an Autobiographical Novel, that are incredibly generous. I have that generous. somewhere in this space, too. <laughs> <laughs> Blessing us all. Um, very tender essays that I would recommend to anyone, whether or not they're a writer. And sort of as a counterpoint to Alex's essays, which are so are so beautiful and generous weirdly i find anita bruckner very tender which isn't if anyone's read her you might be thinking oh but so many of her books are about very angry spiky women who think mean and difficult things about the people around them <laughs> but actually i find the choice to give these misfit outcast space and to live in their eyes to be very tender i feel very reassured by the gift of narrative space for those voices, whereas I think they can often be pushed aside for more sort of Hollywood protagonists in the world of fiction. Actually, a, a book I read recently um, that came to me quite surprisingly, because it's not necessarily the kind of book I would normally gravitate to, but I absolutely adored Lily King's Writers and Lovers. Um, and I found it an incredibly generous book. It was um, optimistic, it was tender, um, it was a happy ending, which I don't normally gravitate towards in my own writing always, um, but I thought that was a wonderful book. I'm halfway through that book, actually, and I, when I was, so now I know it has a happy ending. I'm so oh, relieved. No. <laughs> no, that's fine, but the, one of the things that she, do, she does so beautifully is she, talks, she compares writing with painting. I loved it. I just was uh, reading this just before I joined you all. She was writing about how no one expects a painter to start at one side of a painting and paint their way across. Absolutely. That idea of allowing painters to layer and not understanding that uh, writers do the same thing. Yeah. Mm, we actually, uh, WordPad just had an event this morning with uh, Lily King. Oh. Check that out on our website. We're talking <laughs> about some of these same ideas. Um, let's see. We have one question here um, specifically for Douglas, uh, which is how, how do you keep writing for 10 years and not give up on your novel? <laughs> what what keeps you going? <laughs> Uh, I think that's a great question. Thank you. Um, I think what really kept me going was I, I really profoundly love my characters. And so when I wasn't with them, I longed so much to be back with them. 
um, and to sort of discover what was sort of happening with them next and just to go deeper with them. And so I found myself quite obsessed with them and what they would say and how they would act. And, um, and so really it was the people on the page and not even just the primary characters, but all of them that kept drawing me back in. I think it's also good, um, you know, for my day job, I have an awful lot of expectations on me. I have a lot of, as Rowan put it earlier, um, sort of the need to produce, the need to sort of deliver something. And my writing, I never wanted to have that. And so because I didn't put any expectations on the end book, I felt like I could keep going back to it and just enjoying it for what it was um, because I wasn't rushing it or not that writers rush it, but I just, I didn't have any, any expectations of it. Thank you. Hard to do, I think. <laughs> you know, not put pressure on yourself, but I guess that is in itself a way of um, being tender with yourself. I feel it too. Uh, we'll do one more question. Um, we have one here uh, for both of you. Uh, someone asking, do you write as a way to process grief or emotional intensity while it's happening? Or do you tend to use writing as a way to reflect back? You know, if Rowan, if you would start answering that, but and if I could add on to that, because maybe you could also talk about whether you expect to be writing about this time as well, because I think it, the question kind of has room for that. Um, I believe that there is a Hemingway quote about never writing about the place that you're living and well, I'm not, I mean, I think that assumes a certain lifestyle, so I wouldn't put that on any of our listeners. Um, but I think for me, there, I do subscribe to the not writing where I'm living emotionally. I think at the time I usually, I'm feeling it too loudly to have language for it. In some ways, I think what, pulls me towards fiction and towards storytelling is to create a framework and a network for understanding these emotions that are more colors <laughs> than they are words and be able to process them. But as if I tried to do it as they were happening, I think either it would sort of be like someone screaming into a microphone <laughs> or it would be just like, yes, and then everything was very flat because I can't deal with this. So I, I tend to find myself writing about things that happened a long time ago or that I'm only just beginning to understand. I think because I need that to have the subtlety to, ha to be able to write in layers rather than to say this thing, rather than to be didactic and to say this is how you, the reader, should feel about it because I always want the reader to be able to make up their mind and therefore I need to be able to see it from multiple different angles. Mm -hmm. So the general general point and I think with the pandemic I doubt I will ever write try attempt to write the great pandemic novel but if I keep writing which I hope I do and I hope the world heals to some extent any family any individual in the future will have lived through this time and it may only be a footnote in who they were but I suppose I'll have to think about what they were doing and what their life was like in this moment. Mm -hmm. yeah. Douglas? I think I, I think it's fair to say I do um, use my writing often to sort of process grief or loss but I think more than that what I try to do is to do it to record. Um, mm -hmm. To record especially people that I love or situations or just milieus that I don't see often set on the page. And I feel like that's my writing is a good way to sort of, uh, to really sort of set that, uh, to really bring that to life. I think also sort of being an immigrant and stepping back from all of this, I'm very removed from sort of the first half of my life now living in America. Um, I really just long to sort of like look back on it and sort of really capture this world in as much truth as I possibly could. Um, but in terms of sort of the pandemic or what it would do, I think it would never sort of have a, like Rowan, I would never write a pandemic novel, I don't think. I don't think that's, I'm much more about sort of small social moments and real mm -hmm. domestic scenes. Mm -hmm. um, 
But my writing is always about, I think, uh, loneliness and isolation. Mm -hmm. Certainly Agnes and Shuggy are two people who feel very alone in the world, even though they're surrounded by almost too much on all sides of them. But Agnes, because she, of course, is sort of struggling with alcoholism, Shuggy, because he's gay. Um, and so my writing is always sort of struggling for that sense of belonging for my characters. Mm -hmm. They're always sort of uh, separated from the world they're in, in a way. And I think what I'm understanding through the pandemic is it's just a refresher course on how that really, really feels viscerally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you both so much. Um, I am going to hand it back off to Nancy here in a minute to just close us out. But uh, before I go, I just want to give a little shout out to our authors, our three authors for joining us for this event. Um, and if you go to the landing page for this event on our website at lawwordplay.org, uh, you can find links to purchase each of their published or forthcoming books. Um, so thanks so much for joining us. I'll pass it back off to Nancy to close us out. Thanks, y'all. Thank you. Well, thank you both uh, for getting through all the traffic and other things that we all had to do to get here today. I, I, um, I was kidding around before about how I don't like Zoom, but that's really a lie. Because if, I, if there was no Zoom, the isolation that we all feel, I think, would be so strong. And um, whether it's 10 years or 12 years or four years or two years that you're working on a novel, part of why you're writing a novel at some point it occurs to is to connect with readers so I'm really glad that you know there is this way to connect with readers who are happy to hear what you had to say and to read from your beautiful books so thanks so much great Thank to you. meet you both